Greetings and welcome to African American Identity and Popular Culture Part 2, 1900s. Uh, so this is part two of a three-part series on African American identity and popular culture and all of these are part of a larger series on popular culture in the US. Uh, so in the last video as we talked about and just to kind of keep as a point of reference is uh, to remember as we're talking about these things and understanding African American identity uh, even today we have to understand that so much of it is a legacy of you know, 400 years of cultural dehumanization, uh, 400 years of scientific dehumanization, and 300 plus years of legal dehumanization. So let's take a look at the 1900s. Um, the 1900s, or just prior to the 1900s, started off with a very challenging or, or very long lasting, uh, powerful case before the Supreme Court called Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, and this was the court case that had decided separate but equal. Uh, so this was the creation of a segregate of segregation. Uh, it said that yes, there could be sec separate, but they could be equal. Um, that idea eventually becomes, of course, re you know, challenged and overturned. But it's not for over 50, uh, for actually over 60 years. So what we see also happen throughout the 1890s and 1910s is a rise in the enforcement of the one drop rule. The basis of this rule is that if one of your great 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 grandparents was of African descent you too were considered African American. Now think about this your great of your great 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 grandparents there are 32 people and if just one of them was identified as African American, so would you, right? So thir th this one drop rule really limited um, movement for a lot of people who potentially could not perceptibly be seen as African American. Uh, they started to, you know, it, it was something that really spoke to this idea of or this this goal of racial purity or to you know avoid being part or being connected to African Americans in any way and it had a you know it certainly lingered and it certainly had a lot of implications for people and in, in what they could do if you had a grandparent or a great grandparent it wouldn't matter if 31 of your great 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 grandparents were white if just one of them was African American then that would constitute you as a African American. So as we get into the popular culture history, um, in 1905 a book comes out called The Klansman by Thomas Dixon and this is a book that celebrates the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the South. And it's a, a popular novel and people enjoy it, they enjoy this, this romanticized idea of the South. And we have to remember this is 50 years really after the end of the Civil War and it's this idea of how you know, the the Caucasians came back and they saved themselves from the the African Americans who were ruining culture, who were ruining the South in the 1860s and 1870s after the end of the Civil War. This book ultimately gets turned into a film called *Birth of a Nation* by uh, D. W. Griffith. It is the first major cinematic film. Uh, it's over three hours. In fact, we'll probably watch bits of it later on this, semest this semester. Um, and again, it, you know, is, is the first cinematic major film in our country. And it is focused on race. And it is, it's, it is hard to watch because it is so malignantly racist. It the ways in which it depicts African Americans is atrocious and it leaves such a lingering effect and it says something about you know the American culture that the first major film attempts to whitewash the Civil War and to cast the African American as the fiend and as a villain in a variety of ways. Uh, by 1924 we have the Racial Integrity Act uh, of 1924 Virginia. This is one example of many different acts of the time that basically said that African Americans, it was primarily focused on African Americans not being able to marry people that were identified as white. So again, if we go back and think about the one drop rule, and you have that one, you know, that one or two great, great, great grandparents that are of African descent, 
this means there are people you are not able to marry, that legally it is unallowable. By 1927, we have The Jazz Singer, which is the first talking film in the U.S., and this, too, is a film that is focused on race. It is about a Jewish man who goes and performs in blackface a variety of songs, and it, it, some of it is, a, you know, the, the, the challenge within the film is, of course, the acceptance of doing that, but it's the idea that even our first talking film is focused on this question of race and having somebody go on stage and perform uh, in blackface is a very, very striking image to be thinking about. A couple of years later, one of the most famous you know films to come out in the 1930s, King Kong, uh, is another film that's very much positioned on or discusses race. Um, it is the it is this giant you know gorilla type character you know 30 feet tall, 40 feet tall, uh, who's taken from an island in chains, brought to the United States, and put on display uh, in chains to an audience. And there's a lot of interesting elements of race in this film, and it is very much a film that is about discussing race and, and depicting race in some very, again, negative and stereotypical ways. 1939, we get one of the first color films, uh, and of course this color film is Gone with the Wind, which is another film very much like Birth of a Nation, which attempts to re, uh, re-represent or reclaim the South in this very romantic way and show that, well, you know, there were some, there were some really nice, really nice slave owners who treated their slaves nicely, um, and that was a tragedy that they had, they couldn't have that anymore, and it's just, again, it's a very interesting moment in popular culture where capturing the, the, or attempting to re-represent the past, um, while at a breakthrough moment, color film, uh, produces this very, very problematic message about race. We also have during the 1920s through the 1950s, the Amos and Andy show. And this is, you know, this was a show about what are two supposedly African Americans who, of course, were imbecilic and, you know, they, they did foolhardy things. And again, this was typically portrayed by, at least the radio show was typically portrayed by whites. Um, so again, here we have a lot of times in which the representation of African Americans is being controlled or being presented by Caucasians. And so it's their thoughts or their views of what it means to be African American. And we're seeing that, you know, there, there's over a hundred years of this going on. And so you have to wonder how does that influence how people see race and understand race in culture. From the 1940s to the 1960s, we see the civil rights movements that start to address this and deal with this in some some really profound ways. Um, at least on the legal end, they still have trouble with the po- with the popular culture side, and we'll see that we'll see that um, in the rest of this video. But they do attempt this. They do attempt to reposition both the legal and the representation of African Americans. The 1970s give rise to what's known as black exploitation. Uh, these were films that often hy- both hypersexualized and hypermasculinized African Americans. One of the most famous is, of course, Shaft. Uh, but these were films that really, again, going beyond the imbecilic and the idiotic view or representation of African Americans. These really, really displayed African Americans as hypersexualized and hypermasculine. Um, and this again wasn't necessarily. It, it gave a, in some smaller, exa- in some individual examples, it gave. You know, it, there was progress, but there was also a lot of uh, stereotype and misrepresentation. We also see in 1977 the first TV major TV miniseries, Roots. Um, also at the center of this is a discussion of race, and it's a potentially more positive or intriguing message, but it's still one that. You know, again, who's in control of that message? Um, and again, the you know the representations or the the discussions of African Americans are ver- are often including inclusive or allowing for African Americans to truly engage or represent themselves. <laughs>
Uh, we also see in the 1970s and 1980s a backlash to the civil rights movements. Uh, and there's a lot of discussions, there's, there's a resentment of what exactly it is that they are aspiring for. There's, a, there's a, this supposed threat. Uh, we still hear about this threat today when people talk about affirmative action, uh, when people talk about this idea that um, it's easy as a minority to get into college because you supposedly will automatically be picked or you'll have all of this financial aid in the form of scholarships. A lot of that is actually untrue when you go and you do the research. But there is this backlash, this, this response to the civil rights movements and their attempts to establish equality in the, in the society. 1992, we have the Rodney King riots. Um, and again, there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of questions around the Rodney King riots. Um, this was the beating of a African American, uh, a, blatant, a blatant beating of an African American by four police officers that was filmed. Um, in fact, there's a lot of very interesting parallels to some of the cases that have occurred in the last few years, um, such as what happened in Ferguson and what happened in, uh, in New York. And so, in this case, the you know Los Angeles, large parts of Los Angeles were rioting when the police officers were acquitted um, or were found innocent. And you know the depictions and the discussions around race within popular culture as a result of this, they're still jarring. Uh, you can go and you can look at it and the ways in which they are described, African Americans are described, are, are very is very disheartening to see this in 1992. Uh, 1994 to 96 is the O.J. Simpson trial, a famous football player and an actor who is arrested um, in, in charge with killing his wife and his wife, or his ex-wife and his ex-wife's uh, boyfriend. And of course, um, he's put on trial, and this is the first major televised trial. And again, here it is, this major moment, this big new thing, televising trials, and at the center of it is an African American. Um, from 2008 to 2011, I think another interesting moment in popular culture history about talking about race is the birther movement and Donald Trump and this discussion around whether the first African-American president is even a American citizen. Um, if you've been following along in this lecture right now, you can see there is this attempt, this continual attempt to undermine or to control or to misrepresent African-American identity in popular culture. And the birther movement was just an extension of that. I'm not saying people that believed in the, you know, believed or, or raised questions about uh, where or when uh, the, the president was, was thinking of this, but it's clear that they are influenced by it. It's clear that, you know, this is part of, they have been influenced by this trend of misrepresentation. Um, and then, of course, 2012, I mean, actually the last few years, the Trayvon Martin, um, the, the Mike Brown, the, uh, and uh, Eric Garner, all of whom, you know, represent this very interesting clash of, of course, you know, legal history or what's going on within the law and law enforcement uh, in popular culture and kind of how those narratives are being put out into popular culture how they're being presented on the different talk shows and the news shows and all in the across social media. Um, and just to kind of contrast real quickly, you know, during this time, we also start to see throughout the 1990s, as we were talking about Rodney King and O.J. Simpson, this, this social welfare reform movements that are largely, again, not necessarily always directly, but often implicitly geared towards African Americans. That is, the backlash to civil rights br brings up or creates lots of um, accusations or misrepresentations of who exactly is taking advantage of what. Of what the social welfare reform has a lot of implications or implies a lot of um, a lot of minorities being on social welfare sometimes not entirely accurately or purposely misleading. Uh, and then we also have most recently the Shelby Counterverse Holder in the Voting Rights Act. And this is going to be one that's very fascinating again as we, as we look at the legal history because this goes back to that equal 
uh, that equal opportunity to vote, the Voting Rights Act um, that we saw, or the, the ability for uh, equal voting to occur. And this was something that was brought up in the Civil Rights Movement and now is in some ways being undermined as states start to require certain forms of, of ID in order to vote. And the question is, well, doesn't that then put some kind of um, restriction that somebody now has to go and get an ID or th there's certain things that this raises questions of. So, you know, th this look between, le you know, in, I should say, you know, a lot of this, this question was a around the Voting Rights Act um, and the, the, Holder and the Holder case were purposely either were often discussed with relation to minorities. Um, that's why these cases were going through or that's why these laws were, were being passed was was focused on shifting the opportunities for certain minority groups to vote. All right, so that's a lot to throw at you, but I hope you start to get an understanding of, of how these two things interrelate, of, kind of the legal history and popular culture history that they, they bounce off or they inform one another um, in a lot of ways, and that becomes very powerful sometimes for good, sometimes for, for bad uh, throughout our history. All right. That is all for now. Thank you very much, and see you in the next video.